It's no secret to any of you that my favorite shinobi in all of Naruto is Madara Uchiha. Why is that? Well, I just really love the style, the voice, and that scene where he totally obliterates the entire division of the allied shinobi forces all by himself. That on top of being one of the few who possess a Rinnegan. When he stepped out kicking everyone's rears while blind before declaring to the allied shinobi forces that he would now take control of every last one of the filthy beasts, I got shivers. Madara is my all-time favorite Naruto character. It's why I've been voting for him non-stop on the Naru Top 99 poll. I really want to see more stories involving him, and that brings me to where I am today. A lot of stuff changed in the Naruto story because of a single election. Much like in the real world, the results of a political election can change the world for better or worse, and the same is true for the first Okage. In times past, the first Okage was elected by the village. They were given the choice between Madara Uchiha or Hashirama Senju. Of course, they chose Hashirama, which caused Madara to begin questioning the whole idea of starting a village, something he was skeptical about due to the required Uchiha Senju alliance, which was already full of bad blood. It was this that seeded the doubts in his head that such a thing could ever last, and those doubts budded due to the alteration of the Uchiha Stone Tablet. Due to all of this, Madara would eventually bring the Nine Tails to Konoha under the control of Genjutsu and use it to attack the village. Hashirama would fight him off with his wood golem and would end up having to kill Madara, something that would eventually be undone by Izanagi, allowing Madara to come back to life and escape to the mountain's graveyard, where he would wait for years until passing his hopes of the infinite dream onto Obito, which is really what began the whole series. So returning to the question at hand, what would have happened had Madara become Hokage instead? Would things have changed between Hashirama and Madara? Between Madara and the village? Would Madara still chase after the infinite Tsukiyomi? If not, what would happen in its place? That is something that I would like to examine with you all today. I hope you stick around for the rest of the video because I'm looking forward to this one. Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day. So be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. YouTube has been unsubscribing users from channels lately. So if you're a fan of us, please do us a favor and double check to see if you're still subscribed. It only takes a second and it helps us a ton here at Amagi. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. The Warring States Period. It's a time of great war across the entire world. Much like the great shinobi wars of the future, many nations find themselves battling each other in a war that spans the globe. The difference? There are no alliances. It's just an era of bad blood and killing. An endless cycle of hatred and retaliation. And there is no worse blood between any two clans than between the Uchiha and the Senju. In fact, it is these two clans that seemingly started the Warring States period, specifically the Uchiha. You see, though they don't remember such a thing and have sadly forgotten why they fight besides retaliation, the Uchiha and Senju trace their roots all the way back to the Otsutsuki clan, the children of Hagoromo Otsutsuki, one of two sons of Kaguya Otsutsuki. Many clans trace their roots back to the Otsutsuki clan with the Hyuga clan and the Kaguya clan, the latter of which has become extinct with the untimely passing of Kimimaro. The Uchiha descended from Indra Otsutsuki, while the Senju descended from Ashura. The two brothers once stood on equal ground, learning with innocent eyes and ears as their father taught them how chakra could be used to bring people together and connect with them on a deeper level. The first shinobi, those who wielded Ninshu. While Ashura was nowhere near as as gifted as Indra, he displayed a deep understanding of Ninshu out of necessity. Due to being incompetent and what many might consider a screw-up, Ashura learned that what one could not accomplish alone, they could accomplish easily together. And to that end, he used Ninshu to foster his bonds with everyone he met. Indra, on the other hand, was competent, a prodigy in his time, learning new ways to use chakra, forming the weaponized side of it commonly known as ninjutsu. He was capable and easily able to do anything he set his mind to. Due to this, he rarely required help and even more rarely did he ask for it. It was this pride and focus on self-reliance that caused him to fall short of his father's expectations. Due to this, Indra found it unfair that he was passed over by Hagoromo as the next Sage of Six Paths in preference to his screw-up brother Ashura. This led to Indra disavowing Ninshu, vowing to destroy it and Ashura with his own clan that he would build instead. That clan became the Uchiha clan, while Ashura's clan was renamed the Senju. For years they fought, Indra's hatred so powerful that it transcended generations and was passed on to others, including but not limited to those who would take on the title of reincarnations. This led to great conflict within the world as both the Uchiha and Senju clans utilized ninjutsu to fight, with the two clans being viewed as the greatest warriors in the world. As wars across the planet were waged, often the Uchiha and Senju would find themselves on the battlefield, fighting as mercenaries for the other nations. Eventually, the birth of Hashirama Senju and Madara Uchiha would come. 
These two were innocent of the ways of war and they came together and bonded, playing with each other and lamenting the death caused by war, especially the loss of their kin. They dreamed a simple dream. A pure dream. A dream in which the world would be free from war in which children were so often forced to become soldiers, resulting in entire generations lost to hatred and blood. However, this friendship did not last long. Time came that both Hashirama and Madara realized that they were enemies. This time came when their brothers and fathers showed up to kill each other. Hashirama never gave up on peace, but Madara, having lost faith in their dream, decided instead that the most viable way to achieve peace and prosperity for his clan was by defeating the Senju, something that he vowed to do, sealing his promise with the awakening of his Sharingan. Madara and Hashirama would meet many times in battle, and in at least one of them, Tobirama stabbed and nearly killed Izuna. Izuna survived the initial injury, but found his body weakened to the point that his life expectancy was exponentially shortened. As he lay upon his deathbed, he realized that his brother, Madara, had much like him awakened the Mangekyo Sharingan, and had used it so much in battle that he was now growing blind, barely able to see. And so, as his last gift to his little brother, Izuna bequeathed him his own Mangekyo Sharingan, a gift which would allow Madara to make use of his Mangekyo Sharingan without penalty eternal Mangekyo Sharingan. His death was hard on Madara, and Madara then found himself thrust into the position of clan head, a position that Hashirama had also taken up for his clan. Even with the eternal Mangekyo Sharingan, Madara found that he could not beat Hashirama, the latter proving that Ashura was not incompetent, nor was he unable to catch up to Indra. In the end, the war took its toll on the Uchiha, and slowly they began to see the Senju closing the war. They began to switch sides in hopes of gaining amnesty from the Senju, which they were granted. Madara watched as his forces and clan slipped away. Still, he held tight to his fight, refusing to give in, refusing to surrender. Eventually, he found himself on the end of Hashirama's blade. However, instead of killing Madara, Hashirama reminded him of their dream, going so far as to offer and even attempt to commit suicide to bring peace to Madara and to show him how far he was willing to go for that dream. Hashirama's will proved the stronger of the two, and Madara would finally stop Hashirama from killing himself and would join him as he hoped to fulfill their dream of a peaceful village, where kids no longer needed to fear losing their siblings and family in endless war. Together, they conspired together on the village they wished to make, and it was actually Madara who named it after viewing the village through a leaf. And thus, the Hidden Leaf Village, also known as Konohagakure, was born. But things would not go so smoothly for Madara. Together, both Madara and Hashirama knew that there could only be one leader. And when Hashirama decided to just give it to Madara, Tobirama was like, hold up. He proposed an election to see who the village's leader, or Hokage, should be. And Hashirama and Madara both threw their hats into the ring. The ballots turned up Hashirama, so Madara was defeated. Here he saw a disturbing future lying in wait. A future where the Uchiha would be subservient to the Senju. One where their entire clan would be at risk. And after reading the altered Uchiha stone tablet through his eternal Mangekyo Sharingan, Madara came to the decision that Konoha was a failure. He decided to leave it, and he tried to convince his clan to follow him, but they refused, too unwilling or perhaps afraid to destroy what they had built and begin another eternal war with the Senju, one that they had just escaped barely with their lives. And so Madara would leave, find the Nine Tails, and attempt to use it to destroy Konoha until he was eventually killed, or killed Ish by Hashirama. But let's back up for a moment and wonder what might have happened had Tobirama kept his gob shut and just let Hashirama concede the Hokage's seat to Madara. Or perhaps we assume that Tobirama didn't stuff the ballot box because we all know he would have and let Madara win. What then? Well, Madara would be Hokage and he would not ever feel the need to leave the village. He would not be thrown off by village dejection. I mean, this guy failed to become the Hokage and was like, and I took that personally. Without that immediate dejection at the very birth of Konoha, Madara might see a different future. One where the Senju were all willing to walk as equals with the Uchiha. Not a world where the Uchiha were subservient to the Senju in every way but the word. Instead, a world where the two former enemies walked hand in hand together, and dreamed of a future where peace would prosper. And by his side was Hashirama, serving as Madara's kind mouthpiece and counselor, with Tobirama being the one to walk back all of Hashirama's faux pas, and to counsel the counselor. So, what happens next? Well, first we need to look at Madara, who he is and what he believes. We compare it to his past as well as the beliefs of his former incarnations and succeeding incarnations. One thing to know about any incarnation of Indra is that their prideful, stubborn, and heavy believers in might makes everything right. Madara would value peace, but he would foster it through war, the oldest and most visibly prominent conundrum of mankind's existence. Peace through war. This is actually something that Madara himself would eventually acknowledge. 
that all things have an equal and opposite, with all dualities being a contradiction of themselves, unable to exist as one without the other. Hate is born through love, peace is born through war, victory can only be achieved if there are conquered. It was Hashirama's belief that peace came through love, which itself is a noble endeavor, but the Naruto series proves that both of these views by themselves are incorrect. Peace is born through mutual respect earned by actions, not through words and not through force. Hashirama for so long tried to bring peace through words of diplomacy, and Madara tried so hard to bring peace by the blade. But only when the curse of hatred was overcome and Sasuke and Naruto teamed up did they learn that love balanced with force breeds respect and admiration. It creates a hero, a friend, and due to that, Naruto was capable of putting the world into a long-lasting version of that unnatural state that mankind rarely occupies. So with this short psychological examination out of the way, what would become of Madara as Hokage? Well, we need to look at the world at that time and remember Tobirama as well, who himself would play a big role. Tobirama is a bit of a cynical man and is tough where Hashirama is soft. Honestly, if you ask me, Tobirama was a better Hokage than Hashirama. However, his distrust in people, as seen through his constant hawk's eye he kept on the Uchiha, bred distrust among the village. And this is one of many reasons why the Uchiha felt like outcasts. So while he was close to the type of leader Konoha needed, he was not perfect by any means, and this means Tobirama would also stand somewhat against Madara as leader. Meaning that while he would be willing to help Madara, he would only help him if he asked for it, and I'll let you know now, Madara will never ask for it. Least of all from Tobirama, the man who killed Izuna, his brother. So what happens next? Peace indeed reigns for a while, however it would not last forever. Madara would attack the emissaries of Iwagakure, Mu and Onoki, demanding their subservience to protect the peace he had fostered, out of fear that they would slip back into the feudal era. This, of course, set a disturbing precedent for the world. This would lead to other villages which had sprung up in the wake of Konoha's foundation to view strength as absolute. Whoever was the strongest would lead the others and take whatever they wanted. Due to Madara's show of force against Iwagakure, other villages would attempt the same, hoping to grow stronger and becoming superpowers. This of course would have the direct opposite effect that Madara did not want, which led to wars breaking out between nations. Wondering what to do, Madara ignored Hashirama's pleas to make peace and instead he began to go out of the village, in search of... Something. What was that something? The Nine Tails. Legends had spoke of a force of nature so strong that it could level entire mountainsides. With a power like that, Konoha would be the strongest village in the world. He found the Nine Tails and using his Sharingan brought it under his control, returning to Konoha with it in tow. Together, Hashirama and Madara would search for somebody to plant the Nine Tails into. Normally, you might expect it to be Mito Uzumaki, but it's my belief that Hashirama planted it into her because he felt that he had no choice, and she was good at sealing things up. However, I do not know if Hashirama would ask such a thing of his wife. With Madara's Sharingan keeping it under control, there was no need to rush, so they likely would choose one of their more trusted shinobi to hold onto it for them. Having realized the legend to be true, the question of all-tailed beasts would come up. Madara and Hashirama would continue to search for more of them, eventually coming into contact with them all. Together, they would capture all nine and bring them together into different shinobi, but war continued to loom on the horizon. And so, a Five Kage Summit, the very first of its kind, would be called, and Madara, along with his aides Hashirama and Tobirama, would go to the meeting. The news was dire and grim. Each Kage threatened one another, making snide remarks, mentioning how their settlements were being ravaged by greater nations. The inequality of power made it so that every nation could not defend itself, with the smaller villages and nations nearly losing their autonomy to larger ones. It was then that Hashirama suggested giving some tailed beasts out to the villages to distribute power evenly. The village hidden in the leaves would of course keep the Nine Tails, which was the strongest beast but the others should be evenly distributed to each nation by the number of their tails, so that each of the other four nations could get a set of beasts whose combined tail number roughly equaled nine. Tobirama once again said, hold up. Instead of just giving them out, he suggested each nation should pay Konoha. Both Hashirama and Tobirama turned to their Kage Madara and asked him which one they should do. Madara would tell them that they would do neither and keep all the tailed beasts for themselves. When asked to explain how that would balance the power, Madara states that sometimes the threat of war is enough to stop a war. One sword keeps another in its sheath. Konoha would attack and destroy any nations that threatened the peace they garnered, and that all villages would be subservient to Konoha, 
sharing among themselves all goods to ensure that nations had enough to eat and plenty of land to farm at the threat of war. So while everyone was arguing over their resources at the summit, Madara literally stands, flexes on the other villages, and pulls out a pen to start redrawing the lines on the map. He begins to tell each Kage what they must do and how they must do it to maintain peace. He reminds each village that if they go against Konoha, they would go against the Senju and Uchiha, the two greatest clans in the world, and would further go against the forces of all nine of the tailed beasts. This threat of war, he believes, will be plenty enough to deal with all the other nations. However, things do not go according to plan, as these stronger nations all gather together under a single banner against Konoha to defend the sovereignty, with the tinier nations who have no hope of maintaining sovereignty would either join the side closest to them, or the nation that they believe is going to win, which would be Konoha, hoping for some form of leniency. And because of this, the first Shinobi World War begins, with all the battle lines drawn specifically against Konoha, as Konoha is the greatest threat to their freedoms since before the founding of the villages. Hashirama and Tobirama are blown away by the decision Madara made and see it all crashing down. Tobirama immediately begins drawing up plans to depose Madara and deal with the Uchiha the moment they rise up against Konoha, with Hashirama trying to calm his brother down and asking that he be allowed to talk with him, believing that together they might be able to help. Madara would be confident in himself though, believing that there is no way that he can fail and that there's no way that the war will not be won by Konoha. And so the war begins. The nations, despite having no tailed beasts, are standing up well against Konoha, outnumbering its shinobi by at least 4 to 1. Things don't go as well as Madara planned, however, as due to how fresh each shinobi is to their tailed beast and the fact that the tailed beasts don't like being slaves to the ninja, the Jinchuriki seem to be having a lot of trouble dealing with their beasts and many tailed beasts are being stolen from the Jinchuriki or escaping all by themselves, leaving Konoha with very few, with only the shinobi who were of the Uzumaki clan being capable of holding on to their Jinchuriki powers. This leads to other nations usurping and distributing the tailed beasts between themselves, which quickly begins to turn the tide of the war, as each nation now has the capability to return whatever Konoha can dish out. To that end, Konoha forces are being pushed back, and Hashirama is desperately trying to get Madara to sign a peace treaty and limit the damage being done, but Madara does not want to. It's his hope that they can still win, and so he begins to research whatever he can. It's then that he comes to the Uchiha Stone Monument and reads of the eye that approaches the moon. He realizes that if he can just get the Rinnegan, he'll be able to bring the Ghetto Statue to the Earth and awaken the Ten Tails and begin casting an infinite Tsukiyomi, which will stop the world from being able to fight back as he can simply put all those who stand against him to sleep. But to that end, he needs Hashirama's chakra to mix with his own. And how does he know this? He would have been told by the Zetsu, who would portray itself to be the Sage of Six Paths. Madara, snowed by Zetsu, would begin to go about this by confronting Hashirama and telling him of his plan. Hashirama would not want to use such an extreme measure, but Madara would tell him that this is about survival now, and that the only way that peace can ever come is if they have sufficient firepower. Hashirama asks how they managed to get the other tailed beasts back even if this did work, and Madara tells him to trust him. And so Hashirama gives Madara some of his chakras straight. I'm not talking about the effects of having cells over the course of 50 years, I'm talking straight chakra to immediately mix in with his own. That would definitely awaken the Rinnegan instantly in a similar fashion to how Sasuke awakened it. And so, with the Rinnegan, Madara would go about trying to reclaim the Tailed Beasts, and as it turns out, it isn't that hard, as the Rinnegan has a lot of functions, and one of them is Chakra Chains. If someone manages to pull out their Tailed Beast to fight against Madara, and any Jinchuriki likely would need to resort to such a thing to stand a chance against him, then yeah, he can take it. And given that they would still have three Tailed Beasts left, a number I'm choosing due to it being a well-balanced number, they could push the attack on a single villain at a time. If they can coax the village out, they can reclaim it. And even still, Madara has the Ghetto Statue, which is by default a Tailed Beast that only a Rinnegan user can summon. He would begin feeding the Tailed Beasts one by one into the statue until he had reclaimed all of the Tailed Beasts. It would be then that Hashirama Senju would get a vision from the Sage of Six Paths, telling him not to trust Madara, telling him not to let Madara form the Ten Tails. He would grant Hashirama his chakra specifically for this. Hashirama would come to Madara and tell him that they cannot do this telling him what the risks of doing it are. However, having awakened the Rinnegan, Madara is capable of reading the entire monument, which had still been altered by Zetsu. Hashirama says that he was visited by the Sage of Six Paths, who had told him to make Madara stray from this dangerous path. Madara, however, states that he too had seen the Sage, which was actually Zetsu, and that he could read the monument left for the Uchiha by the Sage. He claims that this is why he was born. He is the reincarnation of Indra, meant to become the next Sage of Six Paths and bring peace to an ungrateful world through the infinite Tsukiyomi. Hashirama knows that he cannot allow this. 
Madara tells him that, as Ashura's reincarnation, it is his destiny to walk behind Madara, just as his ancestor once did. He tells him that as the new Sage of Six Paths, he will save the world and usher in a new era one dominated by the Hidden Leaf who will protect the world as its chairman. Hashirama refuses to allow this, but by this time it's too late. Madara is preparing the infinite Tsukiyomi. The other nations would gather to fight him, with Hashirama and Tobirama gathering Konoha to depose Madara. Madara warns him that this will lead to a civil war within Konoha and that ultimately they will begin another era of warring states if they do so. However, much to his surprise, the Uchiha have joined the Senju against him. This leaves Madara to believe that there is no chance of peace in the world and he believes that it's merely better to cast them all under the jutsu indefinitely. Their bodies may wither and decay on the outside, but they will live many lifetimes of happiness and peace in the dream world, and this dream world will be curated by himself, Madara Uchiha, the true heir to the Sage of Six Paths. Hashirama, mixing his Six Paths Chakra with Sage Mode, enters Six Paths Sage Mode, a grouping of truth-seeking orbs hovering behind him through the air. Together, he faces Madara. As Madara uses his tentails and Hashirama uses his wood human, together their fight creates a large scar on the landscape, a deep valley that would later come to be known as the Valley of the End. As time continued and their battle raged on, Madara would prove to be capable of holding his own. After all, Hashirama had always used Sage Mode while Madara had not. Now Madara is using Sage Mode on top of everything and Hashirama can't keep up. As time passes, the moon rises and Madara approaches close to it casting his infinite Tsukiyomi up upon it, with only Hashirama and Tobirama avoiding it. But as that's being done, Madara has another visitation from the Sage of Six Paths. Except it's revealed to have never been the Sage. It was Zetsu all along. Zetsu takes over Madara's body, transforming it into Kaguya Otsutsuki. Kaguya begins to cast the infinite Tsukiyomi, hoping to turn all people on Earth into Zetsu and reclaim the chakra that was hers all along. However, upon trying, she's faced with Hashirama and Tobirama. Much like in the original series, she would jump through dimensions and prove to be far stronger than even Hashirama and Tobirama. However, you don't put Tobirama down, as even in a weakened Ido Tensei body, he was still an elite shinobi, and he has so many jutsu that it's not even funny. Together they would battle and Tobirama would eventually throw a marked kunai up at Kaguya, but she would dodge it. This was not the attack though, as the moment the kunai passed by her, Tobirama would use the flying Raijin Jutsu to instantly teleport. This would allow him to muster all of his strength and strike Kaguya, pushing her directly into Hashirama's grasp. As his hands, branded with the sun and moon symbols, touched her, the power of six paths would be released, and Hashirama would seal her and the tailed beasts away with the six paths Chibaku Tensei. As she sealed away into this alternate dimension, Madara would be ejected from her and hit the ground. Hashirama would grab onto Madara as Tobirama would put his hand on them both and use the flying Raijin Jutsu to teleport back to their home dimension. Hashirama would tell Madara what he did was wrong, and instead of bringing peace, he ruined it, destroying what they had once built. He tells Madara that he is dying, as that's what happens to a Jinchuriki that loses their tailed beast. Madara nods, as he's known for a while what happens to a Jinchuriki without their beast. Hashirama tells him he can fix it though, if right now he releases the infinite Tsukiyomi. Madara does so and frees all the forces against him. Hashirama would then thank Madara, and Madara would pass away. Tobirama would wish to claim Madara's Rinnegan, but Hashirama would not, believing it to be best to honor Madara enough to allow him to keep them as he's interred. He would then be cremated, Rinnegan and all, and would then be buried in the heart of the Hidden Leaf, his face enshrined on the Hokage Monument beside Hashirama as a way to remember him, not as someone who nearly destroyed the world, but as a true shinobi, a man willing to do anything and go to any lengths to ensure that his village was safe. And while his name is held in contempt by most everyone, with his face being the one most often vandalized, he is still held with respect. Due to Konoha's attempts to protect the world from the Ten Tails, and in dealing with Madara themselves, peace is allowed to return to the world, ending the First Shinobi World War. Good relations begin to follow thereafter as the nations begin to respect each other's sovereignty. Such things don't last forever though, as the issue was caused by Konoha to begin with, and eventually the Second Shinobi World War would begin. Time would pass, and slowly Hashirama and Tobirama would begin to understand that they are old and that time has passed them by. So during the time between the Second and Third Shinobi World War, Hashirama and Tobirama would pass away of old age, leaving them to settle upon a new Kage, Hirazin. Of course, he ends the Third Shinobi World War with a peace treaty, which earns him ire, causing Hiruzen to step down, becoming known as the Hokage serving the shortest term, passing it on to Minato Namikaze. During the course of the Third Shinobi World War, Obito Uchiha finds himself crushed under rubble as Iwanin ambushed them and attempted to kill them to stop their mission of destroying Kanabi Bridge. This results in the death of Obito Uchiha as Madara cannot save him due to also being dead. 
Minato would help his students destroy the bridge, and the war would end not long thereafter. Rin Nohara would survive the war, as it was Madara who manipulated events in a certain way to result in her death to drive Obito closer to him. However, Madara is not there, nor are the tailed beasts, as Hashirama believed it best to seal them away as well to keep them from being used for war. Kakashi is less tortured by these things, yet he still joins the Anbu, and later in life he would marry Rin and give birth to their first child. Minato serves as the legendary fourth Hokage and is present when his wife, a normal Uzumaki girl named Kushina, gives birth to a healthy baby boy. Come to think of it, I wonder if Minato would meet Kushina at all, because she was sent to Konoha specifically to be the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails, yeah? Well, I'm going to ignore that and let her come to Konoha anyway, because you can't just break up such a good couple. Not to mention, it would be sad if Naruto's never born. So, Naruto Namikaze is born and is treated like royalty in the village, basically being his generation's Konohamaru. He has the best teachers and masters many great techniques, including, but not limited to, Flying Raijin, Multiple Shadow Clone, and Rasengan. Elsewhere, Sasuke is also born to Fugaku and Mikoto Uchiha. Itachi himself would have already been born and is a successful shinobi, eventually joining the Anbu and working under Kakashi's team Ro, alongside Kakashi and Yamato. Due to the Uchiha being viewed as heroes for Konoha for helping to defeat the threat of Madara and the Tentails, they are treated with respect and have no reason to feel like outcasts, their wounds with the Senju having completely healed. Thus, Itachi never has to kill them. Due to no-tailed beasts, Yagata, the fourth Mizukage, is unable to properly defend himself and he is overthrown by Zabuza Momochi during the revolution, resulting in a new Mizukage being elected, one that will end the Blood Mist Village's bloody rituals and history, bringing peace to the small village. Nagato never inherits the Rinnegan, as Madara is dead. So, during the Second Shinobi World War, when his parents are killed by Konoha Shinobi, he is unable to kill the Shinobi in a fit of rage. Still, the Konoha Ninja do not harm him, because they never intended to kill his parents, as it happened so fast that it was a knee-jerk reaction. Had they known that Nagato's parents weren't real threats, then they wouldn't have attacked them, and because Konoha's Shinobi aren't monsters, at least most of them aren't, Nagato would be taken in by the Konoha Ninja, and likely would still end up being trained alongside Konan and Yahiko. When they're attacked by the Iwa Nin though, Nagato is unable to do anything to save his friend, and instead they all get beaten to a pulp before Jiraiya arrives on the scene and gives the Iwa Nin his just desserts for beating up on three defenseless children. Jiraiya would never assume Nagato to be a child of prophecy, especially because such a prophecy is never told to him, and he does not train the three to become shinobi meaning the Akatsuki are never founded, and Hanzo of the Salamander remains in power until his eventual death of natural causes. Orochimaru still turns bad though, as it's discovered what he was actually doing to people in an attempt to replicate the wood-release jutsu style, of which only one success was ever recorded, that being Yamato. He's driven off and found the Hidden Sound Village. Naruto enters the academy along with Sasuke, the former having a lot more of a serious personality as to not embarrass his father, and the latter having a lot more of a jovial personality to the point Point of nearly being a class clown. Sakura is also there, but not much changes with her. I still assume that she has a crush on Sasuke, as I don't think she was all about his coolness. He was probably her love at first sight style zing, as Hinata was always Naruto's zing. Naruto would be a heck of a lot more popular too. Naruto also proves to be a lot more capable and intelligent now as well, with Sasuke being his only rival physically, and with Sakura getting better grades than him regardless. He would be put on Team 7 with Kakashi as a special request from the 4th Hokage. Kakashi asks them their dreams, and both Naruto and Sasuke state that they want to be Hokage. They do the bell test, and it's shown that Naruto values teamwork as much as he's capable alone, likely a trait he inherited from his father, though he has a quick temper and doesn't suffer fools, something he inherited from his mother. They would likely still go on the mission with Tazuna to the Land of Waves, where they would be attacked by the Demon Brothers, but this time it's Sasuke who freezes, with Naruto saving him and chastising him. They never run into Zabuza though, due to Zabuza remaining in the Hidden Mist village due to his planned uprising being successful. Haku, oh, Haku. This actually breaks my heart. Haku is never found by Zabuza, and because nobody cared about him and they were likely scared of him, he's either beaten to death as a child or starves. Oh man, my heart actually just dropped a little saying that. Left a bad taste in my mouth. Ah, I can't do it. While logically Haku is deader than a hammer, I am going to specifically change this fate by saying he is still, for some reason or another, found by a mellowed out Zabuza who takes him in and raises him like his own son. Haku would eventually become the Mizukage and would begin pushing through fair rights for all Kekai Genkai users, making laws to protect them, labeling any mistreatment or killings based upon Kekai Genkai a hate crime, of which you can do 10 to life depending on severity. I mean, this likely wouldn't happen in any capacity, but as I said earlier, when I refuse to break up Minato and Kushina, some people need to stay together or it would be too sad. 
So Haku and Zabuza still end up teamed up, but that doesn't change the fact that they never show up in the Land of Waves, likely with Gato's only agents being the now defeated Demon Brothers. Other than that, they may have to face Gato's army of men on the bridge, but I doubt that it'll make much of a difference as Gato's greatest warriors were beaten by a single Genin, a child no less, and failed to kidnap Inari and Tsunami. So the bridge is completed and Gato faces justice for killing Kaiza. The tuning exams happen and most everything stays the same up to the Forest of Death, in which Orochimaru would have no care for Sasuke due to so many Uchiha existing, and likely being that he already has a Sharingan. They move on and make it through the second test, and then pass the preliminaries with flying colors. Sasuke would train with Kakashi, and Naruto would be sent to train with Jiraiya for a while, where he would learn Sage Mode and how to summon Gamabunta. Returning to the village for the finals, Naruto would be paired up against Neji, but due to not possessing the Ninetales, Naruto gets his butt stomped into the ground with no other way to counter the Gentle Fist technique. Sasuke would still manage to defeat Gara, however the finals are interrupted as Orochimaru initiates the Konoha Crush. Naruto would not need to beat Gara because there are no tailed beasts, and so Gara grows up as a normal little boy would, surrounded by love, probably. And Minato would beat Orochimaru hands down with little to no effort. Due to these developments, there is no need to bring Tsunade back to the leaf, leaving her to live in a drunken stupor all she likes. There is no Sasuke recovery mission as there is no need for it. Sasuke never leaves due to having no reason to. Two and a half year time skip occurs and nothing is happening. Gara is never captured by the Akatsuki because they're not a terrorist organization. Instead, Nagato, Konan, and Yahiko are busy as carpenters whose business is called Akatsuki. They make rocking chairs and those rocking chairs are stamped with a cloud symbol and are considered the finest craftsmanship in all of Amegakure, with even Hanzo ordering a few. Yep, Yahiko, Konan, and Nagato do be rolling in dough. Or rockin' in dough. There's no Tenchi Bridge Recon mission as Orochimaru is dead and there is no Akatsuki, no Akatsuki Suppression Arc, only the Rocking Chair Acquisition Arc where Naruto and the rest of Team 7 go to Ame to pick up on the Hokage's orders. No Pain Assault Arc, only Nagato traveling to Konoha where he remembers that Naruto forgot to bring the matching stool to go with it. There's no Five Kage Summit, at least not over threat of a world war, if anything just to check up on all the nations and make sure that everyone's doing alright. No Fourth Shinobi World War Arc. However, there is a Momoshiki and Kinshiki arc, as they return to plant another Tentails. However, they never kidnap Naruto, and instead just try to plant another and feed Kinshiki to it, as that was literally his job, to be a sacrifice for Momoshiki. However, they're faced with the full might of Konoha and the world, facing off against a buffed out Naruto, Sasuke, and Minato, who despite not having 6 path sage mode, they don't really need it. Ishiki rolls around, and Minato likely just uses the Reaper Death Seal on him to seal him away, and Naruto becomes the 5th Okage. The code arc likely happens, but nothing really changes there whatsoever. And that's all, folks. That's how I would see Madara becoming the Hokage going, and how it affects the rest of the story. Lots of details. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.